You're still in the kilt, Jacob. Does that mean that you didn't go to bed last night? <laughs> 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 I thought it was a Some of the great, great players, they have absolutely fabulous technique and they're able to do things that make them sound uh, very special because it's, it's so good. And maybe we'll talk a bit about why it's good and what's different. You've all been taught by, well I was going to say you've all been taught by different people, but you maybe haven't. Maybe a lot of you have been taught. Many of you are local here, aren't you? And have you been all taught by the same person or have you been taught by different people? He teaches to everybody, does he? He must do an awful lot of teaching, eh? Oh, yeah. Do you get taught individually? No. Sometimes. Sometimes when you get taught in groups. Yeah. Groups work as well. I used to, I used to work in a school in Edinburgh. I taught Python there for seven years and I had 63 Python students. Um, and that meant that you couldn't teach um, individually. So quite often they were in twos and sometimes they were in threes. And I felt it, I felt it really worked really, really well like that. So, so I find it was better than, than with, with school age kids than, than teaching them one on one. They were, they were less sort of intimidated or that kind of thing. They more of a lot of competition going on. Amongst themselves. Too. So, uh, you all basically, a lot of you have taught by, by the same person, and then everybody learns to play the bagpipe in different ways with different teachers. So, what I'm going to tell you is only what is my ideas and possibly the way I was taught. Well, I don't want to talk a lot about the way I was taught because it was a long time ago now and things were different then. Uh, Things were considerably different. I started playing the pipes probably what year would it have been? Uh, 1963, probably. That's quite a long time ago. Uh, and when 
I was growing up in Edinburgh, piping was not like it is today. It was a bit of a geeky thing to do in school. You didn't go around advertising the fact that you played pipes. Okay, to get sort of laughed at a bit. Or, and that's not the way it is now, which is great. Uh, it was just a strange, just kind of strange thing to do in those days. And the reason I did it was because my father was a very famous piper and it was just, it was just the thing that I had to, I was told to do, basically. And I'm very glad that I was. But I remember the way, I'll tell you a little story before we start, of how it actually started. It was uh, at school, they had a teacher called Mr. Jack Crichton, and he came around the classrooms with somebody who could play, like one of you guys, and they would go off and play a tune, and this is the pipes, and we were giving lessons, and uh, does anybody want the lessons? And so of course I thought, well, geez, I better stick my hand up, you know, so I stuck my hand up, and we all get taken away. It was showing how to play the scale on, he was the woodwork teacher at school, this guy, and he showed us how to play on a little wooden stick that had little holes, indentations for the notes. So he showed how to play the scale, and then he said, go away and practice for a week, and come back, and I will pick the ones that I want to, uh, and I was terrified that I wouldn't get, get chosen, you know. So I went away and practiced on this little stick thing. And uh, I got to take the lessons, and that's how I, that's how I started. So, but in those days, what happened was, the way you were taught, it wasn't really like today, where people are a little bit more progressive today. In those days, you started off by playing exercises. And you learned the scale, and then you learned the grace notes, then you learned the GDEs, then you learned the Torahs, the all that kind of stuff. And you played exercises over and over and over and over again. And after about a year and a half, you got a tune. And I could play this probably just as well as I can play it now before I even got a tune. This, you know the exercise that goes That one, I could play that probably just as well as that. Not that that was all that brilliant. But uh, before giving the tune. And that doesn't happen now. You always get a tune almost straight away when you learn to play one gray stone. How long did you get taught your shaking Eight months of exercise. Eight months of exercises. So what time period was this? Two years ago. Two years ago? Yeah, two years. Well, where was this? Right, good. Well, well, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. If you can uh, last the, the, it's not all that interesting if you don't have a tune. And when I started, I started off in a class of 16. And I think after three months, there was two of us left. So, and we both became quite good. So, but it wasn't, it's an old fashioned way of doing it. And it's probably much, probably to hold people's interest to give them a tune and all that stuff. But as a result, you could play all these exercises. And so when you got the tune, <coughs> the simple tunes were quite easy to play. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that the teacher used to do is, right, here's the tune, and I'm going to play you the first part of it, so to let you hear it, and, and uh, then you learnt the tune after that. And sometimes I think it's probably not all that good idea, an idea to let somebody hear the tune before they try it for the first time. You should actually read the music and work it out for themselves, but it's a lot easier at least to have a little, a little bit of uh, a going on in your head before you start. So what I want to do is we will go through exercises. This is a class about technique. And we'll go through a few exercises. I haven't brought any paperwork with me uh, for one reason, because the document I was going to use, uh, I worked out with 20 people in the class, and it's 10 pages long. It's just an extraordinary waste of paper, and you probably have all these exercises anyway. They're just, but if you want to go to the source of what I use, there's a useful web page called, if you just Google in something like Scottish Army Cadets. 
Scottish Army what? Cadets. Oh, yeah. Scottish Army Cadets. And if you go to their website, you can find a section there, and if you just look at, they've got a wee thing on the left hand side, and it'll go, it's a little menu, and it says exercise sheets, and you can just print them off from that. It's, it's what they use, and they're, they're bog standard exercises, but I'm sure you've got, all got exercise. Do you have exercise sheets? Or in your tutor's book, there'll be a series of exercises, so you probably don't need to do that. But if you do want to download that, they're very, very good. So when you start, you're taught to play grace notes, and there's two different ways, I know there's two different ways that grace notes are taught, and it's either that you make a very, very small grace note or a very, very big grace note. You know, either lift your hand a small way off the chanter, or you lift a long way off the chanter. And I am very, very much of the opinion and that by far the best grace notes are small ones where the fingers hardly come off the chant. And that might be totally contrary to what you've been taught. Okay? If so, that's fine. There's always different ways of getting to the same place. But having said that I believe in small grace notes and sharp grace notes, I'll need to tell you why. Uh, quite simply because the shorter the grace note, the sharper the grace notes, the more the notes in between the grace notes sound. So in other words, if you're going to make an E doubling, like that, the smaller these grace notes are, you've got an E in between them. The smaller the grace notes are, the bigger that is. So the bigger the separation of the notes. If you play them big, then the E in between is either the same length as the G and the F grace note, or it's even smaller than the grace note. So you're actually making grace notes that are bigger than the actual, than the actual note in the middle. So that's number one, is to begin to realize that good technique is all about not the grace notes, but the note in the middle. You all follow that? What I call sometimes, I call that static grace note. So if you've got C doubling, that C that sounds as soon as you play the G grace note, is what I call a static grace note, because you don't have to do anything to make it. As soon as you make the G grace note sounds, so when you're playing a march, I can't play the tune now. I'll try another one. Uh, a march, tell me a march. You can make it just like that with the grace note small and the note in the middle big. I think that's probably the most important thing I can tell. I'm going to try and tell you lots of things, but that's probably the most important thing about all the doublings. When you play them, short little grace notes, especially say when you're playing GDEs. If you go... I think, I think the whole theory about lifting the fingers high, so you make clear grace notes or, or, or like that, I suppose that's okay. And, but when I've gone into, I used to teach a lot of summer schools, and you could, you could tell people who had been told to make big grace notes almost, almost straight away. So when it comes to, it comes to the toilets, they kind of sound that type of, not as bad as that, but. So keep the grace notes small is my advice, uh, and I can tell from the action of some of you already that you've probably been told to lift your fingers high. If you've been told to do that, uh, that's fine. Two different ways of getting to the same place, but you might want to try to make them small because you'll find that you go and listen to, it's great these days with YouTube and all that, you can YouTube great players and you can listen and try and figure out what they're doing. And you'll see that all the good guys 
bridges have got small bridge notes and very big, what we call static bridge note, is as big as possible. Uh, have you heard of a Have you heard of a piper, a very famous piper? He's dead now. Called Pint Major Angus Macdonald. Yep. How many people have heard of Pint Major Angus Macdonald? He probably, I think, I'm pretty sure, has got had the best finger technique that I've ever heard. And if you if, if you get a recording of him, that was one of the recordings I wanted to play again here. If we get wirelessly hooked up, which we're not going to. But some of you have probably got his album. There was a series of records made called <coughs> World's Greatest Pipers Albums. Do you know the ones I mean? Have you seen any of those? And he's he was the first one. And I strongly advise you to hook out that recording and buy it and listen to him. Because he's got absolutely fabulous technique at, at, at quite a fast tempo. Uh, and you'll, you'll see about the big notes in the middle of the of all the movements. It's really quite important. So let's try some of this stuff, all right? Let's try, let's go to the GDEs and we'll play as a group. And what I want you to play <coughs> is just <coughs> say four in each note. <coughs> Just like that, and make the grace notes small. Let's try one, two. Not too fast, okay? Not too fast at this speed. And think about small grace notes, and think about the gap between the grace notes being as big as you can make it. As big as you can make it. So short grace notes and a big gap between them. And what we're going to do this time, we're going to play them all. So we're going to play four in each, like, and go up the scale and back down. But four in each, okay? Off we go. And nobody rush ahead. One, two. Tutor book, if any of you learned from that. Uh, it's quite simply. How many people have done that exercise? One. Great. Good. I was hoping that nobody would have played it. <coughs> One's a pretty good result. All you do <laughs> is you play low G and you start make a grace note with each finger from the thumb all the way down. So let's try that. It's kind of neat one. It's about the closest you get to a fun exercise. You know? <laughs> Exercises, what you should be aiming to do is to play them as fast as possible without stumbling. Okay, it's almost like, uh, uh, you know, it's, if you played them slowly, it's almost like running. If you go out running and you're a fitness fanatic, uh, it's no good running at two miles an hour. That's not going really to do anything for you. You've got to push yourself a bit and run a bit fast and this with the exercises if you play at this this speed it's not going to do you a whole lot of good so you need to 
look upon these exercises as speed exercises, but not to the point where you start stumbling and making mistakes. So if you try to play them too fast and you're making mistakes, bring it back. But play them as fast as you can. Okay. So I'd expect, from what I'm hearing, this group probably to play maybe this speed. Something like that. And you'll find it's your mind that doesn't click the first few times to do that rather than your fingers. Because you've got to concentrate on making all these crazy stuff. Let's try it a little bit faster than one. Two. <laughs> bit, bit too fast? Bit too fast? All right, well, that's it. Let's pull it back. Now, there'll be some people in the class who can do it. That's something you can. Let's pull it back a bit to about the speed. Okay. One, two. That's one. Play that one a lot, because that's really that's a really good exercise. <coughs> that's a really good one. As fast as you can without making that encourage you to make nice, nice small grace notes, sharp grace notes, which is going to show off your technique. Uh, now the other one I like is this one. How many of you have done this one? How many have done that? And you've done it? Great. You've done it? Three, only three people. Don't you people play exercises at all? No. You've got, you do, don't you? You do. This is quite an easy one. G grace note, on the way, up two notes. Everybody do that. And then it's... Good. And so on. So it's let me play. the end, you're going to substitute, of course, a thumb grace note for a G1, where you have to, and then just to finish it off when you get up the top, just uh, one of these, whatever they're called, and then another one to start going down. Like that. Okay, let's try the whole thing, slowly. sure probably all of you do already. Now it's quite interesting when we talk about technique. Uh, I'm sure, and I've taught this way before I was bright enough to actually think about it, 
You know how almost everything you're told is you make the grace notes the same length? Well, if you actually sit back and think about that, you don't make them the same length. There's hardly any time you make them the same length at all. They're almost the same length, but they're not. If you take a torga, it sounds like a, a one at a good speed would be. And if you slow that down a bit, that's the rhythm and that's the way it's played. Those grace notes are not the same length. This is the same length. That's the same. It's completely different. The first two There's a little pause right there after that. Everybody do that. Little grace note. And then when you get there, make them a little bit faster, they sound like that. So not all the grace notes are the same length. And if you move on to, we've done a little bit of it, the GDEs, they're not the same length either. And the reason, I think the reason I actually got thinking about this, because when you're taught, you tend to just take everything in and you don't question it, it's, it's the gospel and you, you just do it. And that works, it's fine, but the reason I started thinking about this stuff was, you know, when you write out tunes on the computer with, the, with, with a, a software program, like Bagpack Music Writer or one of these things, and you play it back, and then you begin to think and you hear it, and if you write a jig out and you hear it on the computer, and of course, because it's a computer program, all the grace notes are the same length. And you go, wait a minute, that's not how that's not how we play that. We can play it a little bit different. So with a GDE it's a rhythm that's almost like uh, almost the same but not quite. And when you're top piping and when you play in bands and everything else, there's a great big, there's a, there's a movement to say, well, we've got to play all the grace notes exactly the same length so that we all play together and we all sound good and it's exactly playing together. And actually, what, fact, what comes out is quite strange sounding, doing it that way. So instead of a jig sounding, uh, let's think of one with probably a GDE grace notes. That's got that nice one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three going on it. I don't think I can do it like that. And it just sounds horrible. And generally, if you're playing in bands, they tend to play things a little bit slowly too in order to get everything together, and it even sounds worse. So the whole idea of playing grace notes exactly the same is something that's possibly not all that great. So try playing. And it's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. A lot of people can't do that. It's really hard to get that exact rhythm. Try it. Go to B now. Fast as you 
as you can without stumbling. <laughs> and make these things speed exercises. Okay. How many Peaver players have we got here? How many people play Peaver in the group? No, not all that many, eh? Okay, two or three, okay. Right, we'll cancel that part of the class then. <laughs> Uh, no, I will say something about, about uh, for, for the three of you that are paper players, about the Krumla movement. It's the same as the Torlua movement, all the grace notes are not the same length. When you listen to a Krumla being played, do you guys know what a Krumla movement is? No? no? You will in about 10 seconds. Uh, Not all the grace notes are the same length there. This is the same length. This is not. There's a rhythm to it. You can't have a rhythm if they're all the same length. So this is to Get this in the head. Everybody do that. You guys do it too. Did you see what I was doing there? <coughs> Everybody? Some of these are my ideas, some of them are like, things that you talk to me and whoever's teaching you almost certainly will have a totally different way of getting to the same place, right? Uh, so it's all very interesting. What else have we got? Uh, we've talked about the doublings a little bit. Now, do, you play the, do you play the doubling exercises like this? That's all high A doublings. You can do that and go through each one. Etc. Or you can play them if you want to get through it very quickly. You can play all the different doublings in the one scale. Now let me think how you do that. That's all the ways. That's a different one in each one. That only takes 10 seconds or so of playing rather than going through the whole thing. It's probably better to go through the whole thing. Which way do you do it? Let's do just this simple one. That one, okay? movements, that one, the 
C is as big as possible. In order, but the difficulty is then you have to fit that into time, into the time of the tune that you're playing. So the really good players are the ones that can find a way of fitting in these big spaced out bass notes with, with, with big spaced out middle notes rather than with short bass notes and fit that in time with the music. And if you get that recording of Pipe Age Agnes McDonald playing, you'll see exactly what I mean. It's really clear, it's really accurate. It's to the point where I don't know how he does it. I've never quite worked out how he does it. Um, it's really quite interesting. Let's try that one again, the doublings. Want to do that? 
We'll get on to the grips, okay? We'll get on to the grips. Um, I don't know. Don't touch. Don't touch. I wanted to give you before. The grips. And this, I think, is the most valuable exercise of all. And perhaps none of you have heard this one before. I don't know. It's quite good. It's kind of fun to play. It's quite simple to learn. It's for crossing noises.
something like that. I think you can all get there pretty, pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, that's a good one. I like that one. I think that's the best exercise there is. Uh, now, let's do some grips. All right? The grip. The grip is... It's almost like a torlu, except that this finger doesn't make a grace note at the end. It stays up. Again, small grace notes. Uh, with plenty of space in between them. That's 
每个人，他真懂，他真懂，他真懂。It's an exception to what I'm saying. This is a big low G. You've got to have. Low G is big as you can possibly make it. Now, how do you fit that in time to the music? Carefully. Right? You want to give low G over time. <coughs> Where are you going to take it from? Where are you going to take time from? The note before? The note before, exactly. Yeah. So you imagine a quarter note, low A, and then the throne D. You're going to eat back into the time of the quarter note. What's my food? Where's my food coming down? coming down in the throw part of it. It's not coming down the low G. So all of the low G is contained in the value of the note before it. All of it. So when you play your simple tunes. All that low G is before the beat. Okay? And people that make fast throws those and these that aren't solid sounding is because they're probably starting the low G on the beat. There's no time to put it in. There's no time to make it big. So a throw and D is always Let's play it just like that, everybody. Sometimes if you mess around with the position of your hands, it can help. So after 40 years of playing, about two months ago, I went from putting my fingers like that. I actually just did this. That's all. Do you see that? I just, instead of having my hands like that, I just went, I have to consciously remember to do it. That's made actually a great difference in my playing. What about your thumb? What about my thumb? Well, I was having to tell my... To put that thumb lower down. Right. Well, I don't even think about it. My, I think most people's thumbs, there's, there's where mine goes. I think most people's thumbs are further down. Can you? They're right here. Twist yourself around. Twist myself around. <laughs> Mine, mine's here, almost directly. Just below the, the index the finger. finger. Yeah. I think most people, it's a little bit further yeah, down. Yeah, I've been told to put mine. Put it where it's comfortable. 
but it's where it's comfortable. It doesn't feel comfortable. It feels comfortable more high up. Like Does it? Well, yeah. My advice is just do that. It doesn't matter where that finger is. It doesn't do anything, right? So uh, my advice would be just put it where, where it naturally goes. And then I said there was two things. Not one about the hand position. Yeah. And don't have your hands tight. Tension in any musical instrument is uh, is a real enemy. You've got to try and yeah, you've got to avoid the death grip if you can. I know that's very very hard. Uh, quite light, not not firm, but not 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 death grip stuff is is, is uh, not good. Okay, I think this is the time I'm meant to let you go. I'm not sure. Let me just check my little thing. You've been sitting here for almost an hour, so you've probably had enough. Play the exercises, okay? And, and small bridge notes, and remember, the technique is the thing that you can continually get better at. Yeah?